uh, the root of the conflict is very different than the symptoms of the conflict. What do I mean by that? The symptoms of the conflict are commonly described as Iran's state sponsorship of terrorism, or U.S. sanctions on Iran, or Iran's nuclear program, things like that. But I think, again, those are symptoms of the larger problem. Uh, what's the larger problem? When the Iranian Revolution happened in 1979, Iran went from a compliant client state of the United States to one that rejected the American-led security order in the Middle East. Uh, so what does that mean? You have a handful of countries in the Middle East, arguably the majority of countries in the Middle East, that when America says jump, they all say how high. Uh, we set up the rules of the game in the Middle East uh, after World War II, and we've been running it ever since. Countries that don't play by our rules, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Gaddafi's Libya, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Assad Syria, we do everything in our power to weaken, destabilize, and potentially overthrow these governments. It's not a secret to anyone that studies this part of the world. So the United States is not willing to change the regional security framework that we've set up in order to accommodate Iranian preferences. And Iran is not going to enter into the regional security framework as we've established it since the end of World War II, entirely predicated on patron-client relations, Israel notwithstanding. So what would appear to be a zero-sum game that would inevitably lead to some sort of military conflict, the only saving grace that's prevented that so far is that 34 years we haven't been talking. So before you check that last box, which is war, you have to check all the other boxes that come before it. And diplomacy is a big box that comes before war. Fortunately, we're in the process of giving it a real go this time around, probably for the first time in 34 years. I would say that there's two reasons why this has gone on for so long and so fiercely. One, and, and the most tragic reason, is that when one side has been willing to dance, the other hasn't. The stars haven't really aligned until recently, meaning both sides have been willing to talk. Uh, the trouble with this, of course, is that over the past 34 years, the both sides have been escalating the conflict bit by bit by bit as we've ramped up sanctions, uh, secret assassinations on Iranian nuclear scientists, computer viruses. The Iranians have systematically advanced technical aspects of their nuclear program. When George W. Bush was president, they had a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand centrifuges spinning in Iran. Today they have 19,000. So it's escalated to a point now where it's sharpened the focus of both sides, where we quite literally were on the precipice of a military conflict that I think both sides would independently seek to avoid. Uh, so thankfully, both sides have kind of stepped back from the brink and decided to give diplomacy a real chance to see if, in fact, we can avoid that worst possible outcome. You know, I think it's incomplete analysis to say that the sanctions brought the Iranians to the table. Sanctions have destroyed the Iranian economy. Sanctions have put a massive amount of pressure on the Iranian government. But we have to remember that as the, we have ramped up sanctions on the Iranian government, especially over the past three years, they have ramped up the technical aspects of their nuclear program. If you were to chart it out, as myself and two of my colleagues have in a report that we released in March, it shows very clearly that as sanctions have increased, so too have the technical aspects of Iran's nuclear program. So sanctions alone, sanctions themselves, uh, this idea of bringing Iran to the table, you could just as easily say, as my colleague Trita Parsi has pointed out, that 19,000 centrifuges brought the Americans to the table. So rather than this idea of what brought one another to the table, we need to focus on the fact that now we're at the table and how can we maximize the chances of success now that we're there, because we haven't been there for a very long time. I don't think you can say all of Iran is happy. You know, depending on who you ask, there's maybe 15 to 20 percent of the country that actually supports the hardliners in Iran. Uh, so they're certainly not happy with the deal. And we know they're not happy with the deal because when they were leading the negotiations with the P5 plus 1, they adopted a completely different approach. Uh, so that's one subset of Iranian population that's not happy. And then there's probably even people inside of Iran that support this government that don't support the deal. They would have hoped to have gotten more from the West up front in terms of concessions on Iran's program, the technical aspects, concessions on sanctions relief, uh, concessions on talking to the Iran about other regional security issues, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. Uh, but that's the magic of politics and diplomacy. You can't please everyone. A good deal is always going to have critics. A bad deal has no critics on one side and a lot of critics on the other. Trust is not important at this point in time. 
And it's a good thing that it's not because it's non-existent, especially between the United States and Iran and Israel and Iran. There is trust between Israel and the United States, even though uh, some political leaders in Israel would like to say, usually unattributed quotes, by the way, that trust has dissipated. But at the end of the day, we've demonstrated we have their back, and uh, they really don't have any other allies that they can turn to the same way that they turn to us. I mean, let's be real. That being said, we should be thankful that trust is not vital at this point in time. You build trust through the diplomatic process by reaching an agreement that has concrete verification mechanisms in place so that if one side cheats, the deal falls apart. The beauty of this interim deal that we struck in Geneva is that both sides made it so that the steps that they've taken can be reversed very easily. The technical aspects of Iran's nuclear program that they've agreed to curtail or roll back can be pushed forward again if the United States or other members of the P5 plus one renege on their side of the deal. And the tiny bit of sanctions relief that we're offering the Iranians in this interim step, that spigot can be turned off if the Iranians are caught cheating. So the, mecha the way that it was constructed is precisely because there's no trust. If both sides live up to their end of the bargain, it builds trust. It creates a foundation from which a larger diplomatic process, which we're going to see over the next six months, can continue to grow. I think there's three important points to consider when you talk about Iranian politics. Point number one is that Iran has politics. Because a lot of people in Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway, say that it's one man, one vote and that man is the supreme leader. I think we found out in June of 2013 in their election that that's false. Iran does, in fact, have politics. And point two is that alliances and enmities within Iran's political system, within Iran's political elite, shift all the time, especially around elections, whether it's the parliamentary elections or the presidential elections. So groups can come together in an effort to maximize their leverage in the run-up to and immediately after an election. And then the further away you get from an election, the further apart they go in their political and economic cooperation. And then the third point that I would point out is that while it sometimes is useful to lump individuals or factions within the Iranian system as reformist or conservative or hardline or moderate, at the end of the day, you actually have to look at the trajectory of an individual. And I think the current Iranian president is a perfect example of that. I think one could have considered him to be you know, a conservative. Some would even have called him a hardliner 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, not anymore. I'm not going to say that he's a Democrat. I'm not going to say that, you know, he's a reformer in the same vein as former President Khatami, for example. But I think the positions that he's staked out on foreign and domestic policy so far are markedly different from his predecessor, night and day, on a lot of core important issues. Issues that were important to Iranian voters, and now they're waiting for him to live up to his campaign promises. Uh, in the first hundred days, I think you've seen some progress, not nearly enough and not nearly as much as those of us inside of Iran and outside of Iran would have liked to have seen. Uh, but the real test comes now that we have this interim deal. If you create political space inside of Iran based on the external policies that you conduct, it's your responsibility, I would think, as a political leader to run with that space and uh, live up to your campaign promises. But time will tell. I think this is one of the biggest issues that's going to be up for discussion in step two of the negotiations that's taking place. The interim deal was step one that bought everybody a six-month window to hammer out a larger agreement. And Iran has been uh, hankering for a seat at the table when it comes to regional security issues for years. In fact, I'd argue that they've created a seat for themselves at the table, contrary to the hopes, desires, and policies of the United States. Because let's be honest, when it comes to Iraq, Syria, Israel, Palestine, Afghanistan, energy security, non-proliferation, that's a half dozen issues right there that cannot be solved. Critical U.S. national security interests that cannot be solved without Iranian participation. And we tried to solve them over the past 10 to 15 years without the Iranians. How successful have we been? The only thing we haven't tried is talking to them at the negotiating table. So here we are now where they were willing to give up more in the first step of the deal in order to get what they really want which is to talk about all of this stuff. Because once you're talking to them about all of this stuff, then that is a tacit agreement to shift the regional security framework. And I would argue that the Arab Spring has already shifted it in ways that the United States can't predict or control. It's not like these things can happen in this part of the world and you just put a lid on it. When the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's out. You just have to figure out how to deal with the aftermath. And if the Iranians are willing to alter their policies in a way 
that creates greater convergence with what American interests are, I think that's something that we should pursue. And I think that's something we're going to pursue. Thank you.